than anybody else in the audience. And although he was a student of mine at one time, it wasn't very long after that that I started learning much more from him than he ever learned from me. And so I'd like to thank him for that. I'd like to wish him happy birthday and tell you guys a couple of things about him that you may not all know. Some of you probably know all of these things. Nadi has been many things. Here are some of them. Here's another one. He's been a sharpshooter. He's been a weatherman. He's been a card shark. He still is a card shark, as far as I know. He's been a Susie evangelist. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, he's always been the most creative and productive physicist of his generation. And I think we're all very grateful to have been around during his time. Now, one of the things I didn't learn from Nadi was how not to talk about or publish things that I don't understand. And so this talk will be quite conjectural, but I think it is quite serious, and I'll try to give you some serious arguments for what I'm claiming. And what I'd like to claim is that, despite the beautiful talk that Mike Green just gave, there isn't actually a non-perturbative scattering matrix in any theory of quantum gravity. Now, we know that this is true in four dimensions. This is an old result. There are infrared divergences in the scattering matrix in four dimensions that come from the fact that there is zero probability not to emit an infinite number of gravitons. The scattering operator doesn't exist in Fox space. Fadeev and Kulish, and more lately, Akuri and his collaborators have tried to construct in perturbation theory a space in which the scattering operator exists. I should mention that none of these problems are very practical problems. If you were an experimentalist, you would neglect them all because we're talking about infinite numbers of gravitons with extremely low momentum. So if you have some threshold in your detector, you don't measure them. You really measure inclusive cross-sections. And those are perfectly OK in four dimensions. And you could do the same thing in higher dimensions. You would not be able to address the question, if you cared to, of whether black hole formation and evaporation was unitary, because you wouldn't know what the Hilbert space was in which the scattering matrix was supposed to be a unitary operator. So I'd like to argue to you that this is true in any number of dimensions, not because there is zero probability not to emit an infinite number of gravitons, but because there's a finite probability to emit an infinite number of gravitons in any process. And there are a number of arguments for that. Andy, could you save the questions for the end? Um, in, in regions of moduli space, where there are no dimensionless parameters, like the string coupling in quantum gravity, the expansion parameters we have are kinematic invariance divided by the Planck mass. Now, we know, both from string theory and from quantum field theory arguments, and I think there are probably some more general arguments than that, that this series never converges. It's an asymptotic series. And that implies mathematically that the scattering amplitude, suppose I look at the two to two scattering amplitude that Mike Green was talking about in his talk, that scattering amplitude, if I was in a region, not the region Mike was working in, where I'm expanding in G-string, but say the M-theory region or the F-theory region or some region where the only expansion parameter is the uh, energy over the Planck mass, this implies essential singularities when kinematic invariants go to zero. Those essential singularities cannot be accounted for by intermediate states involving any finite number of zero energy particles. 
So I think that's a very strong argument that we have to consider a different space. Now, Steve Schenker and his collaborators invented a non-perturbative formulation of certain versions of string theory called matrix theory. And that non-perturbative formulation seems to have scattering amplitudes for finite numbers of particles, but it's a theory of n by n matrices, and the instructions in that theory are to take the limit as n goes to infinity, looking at states that have energies that go like one over n. And so if I take small enough transverse momentum, but I take longitudinal momentum of order one, that is little pieces of the matrix whose size is of order one as n goes to infinity, those states also have an energy that should be included in the limit, and those are precisely the soft gravitons that I'm talking about. So they survive the large n limit, and there's no argument from matrix theory that the scattering matrix with just a finite number of particles is a, a finite unitary matrix. Finally, some of you may try to argue on the basis of the ADS-CFT correspondence where we certainly can calculate Green's functions with a, a finite number of operator insertions and that generates the entire Hilbert space of the CFT. You might argue that that implies via the claim that the large radius limit of ADS gives rise to Minkowski space, you might argue that that implies that there is a unitary S matrix in Fox space. I would argue the contrary, that, that this is evidence, and I will not talk about this today because it's work in progress, that in fact you can't get the Minkowski S matrix non-perturbatively as a large radius limit of ADS-CFT correlators. So what do we actually do? Well, there's an idea that's been around in the discussion of the infrared problem for many, many years, starting with the work of Sturman and Weinberg in QCD. There was work by Wan and Hoffman, and a lot of recent work by Andy Strominger and numerous collaborators that talked about, instead of thinking about particles, though Andy in his talk yesterday was talking about particles, but they identify a set of important objects in the theory, which are currents that tell you about the flows of quantum numbers through the conformal boundary. The simplest and most important example that's there in any theory of gravity are the Bondi and Metzner Sachs generators. Now, the general way of speaking about these is as symmetry operations, asymptotic symmetries. That's the way they were int originally introduced in the GR literature. Um, I like to think of them in a different way, and I don't completely understand either the notion of them as symmetry operators or the possible connection of that notion to the way I think about them. The BMS generators are an infinite set of commuting operators that tell you about the momentum that are flowing out along some particular direction at infinity, or flowing in in the past. Since they're an infinite set of commuting operators, you can diagonalize them all simultaneously. And you can think of that space, which is a light cone, p squared equals zero, you can think of that space as the Fourier dual of null infinity itself. What this is analogous to, for those of you who know about light front quantization, in light front quantization, you can think of that with relation to null infinity by taking a tangent space to the sphere at null infinity in some particular direction. And we always find it convenient to consider the longitudinal momentum in that direction to be a separate coordinate. We do this all the time in light cone gauge string theory. We don't write things in terms of x plus, but rather in terms of p minus. So the momentum space version of null infinity 
is a way just of thinking about the same space, but in, in a way that is more accessible, I would claim. So what can I think about the space p squared equals zero? The general vector in that space is a positive number I'll call p plus times a null vector plus or minus one plus or minus omega. Plus or minus one refer to the top and the bottom of the null cone and you choose one of those to be the future and one to be the past. I happen to like putting positive energies in the future, negative energies in the past. It's a pure convention. And then what plus or minus omega means, at a fixed value of P plus, I have a sphere. But there's a null momentum that goes out through that sphere and a null momentum that's coming into that sphere and is traveling along the null boundary. This gives you a very convenient way to talk about massive particles as well as massless particles by keeping two copies of this null cone, one describing momenta coming in in the past and going out in the future, and the other describing momenta that travel along the null boundary. If you think about a finite causal diamond, you'll realize that a typical time-like trajectory of a massive particle actually penetrates the causal diamond most of the time through its null boundary, not through those little tips at the end, which seem to be all that's left when you take the Penrose limit. So I believe that the correct way to think about massive particles is really to think in momentum space partially. Notice the angles are the same. Everything is localized in angle, both in momentum space and position space at the same time, okay? <clears throat> but to use the momentum space version of this. In addition to this, what we'll find when we dig a little bit deeper is that the number P plus is actually an emergent quantum number, which is a feature only of the limit of taking infinite causal diamonds, and you'll see in a minute that taking that limit should be done with a great deal of care. So what else can I talk about when I think about things flowing out to infinity? Well, as I said, other quantum numbers that we typically think of as being carried by particles. Now, one quantum number that's always there is helicity. Massless particles carry helicity, massive particles carry spin. A particle of fixed momentum will have some little Hilbert space that describes its possible spin or helicity states. And so we have to have some operators that carry helicity. And we certainly have fermions in the real world, so it's reasonable to think that those include uh, the possibility of helicity one-half. This is not going to be a claim that I can prove something which I believe, which is that theories of quantum gravity and asymptotically flat space have to be exactly supersymmetric. But that's really a question of whether you have generators carrying helicity, spinner generators Q, that depend only on the outgoing momenta these guys here, if you have both Qs of P and Qs of P tilde, that would be describing massive half-integer spin particles going through the boundary. And it could describe the massive gravitino of a theory with spontaneously broken Susie. I really think there are no such theories in Minkowski space, but this is certainly not a proof of that. So now what are, the, um, what are these generators supposed to do? Well, they have an obvious transformation property under the Lorentz group. The Lorentz group acts on this space of operators. And my fundamental claim is that if you, you give these operators other labels describing other quantum numbers, and those of us who are string theorists will be comfortable with the idea that those other quantum numbers have something to do with 
compact internal dimensions, but just put them in there, you can write down an algebra which is fairly unique. This is a translation of an algebra, a translation and generalization of an algebra that was written in a famously obscure paper by Awada, Gibbons, and Shaw, who studied the supersymmetric generalization of the bondi metzner sachs algebra. This is it. Looks as follows. I'm going to write it as if I have only massless uh, spin a half generators. That would be what would be true in a theory with exact supersymmetry and supergravity. The plus and minus signs on these generators refer to the past and the future null cone. The P and P prime are two different momenta on the null cone. And what we should expect is that these things anti commute unless I'm going in exactly the same direction. If I take two things that are going off in non-parallel directions, then they're infinitely space-like separated. And so they should anti-commute, so I should have a delta function of p dot p prime here. And then once p and p prime are parallel, one of them has a larger p plus than the other, and I stick in the one with the smaller p plus. So m mu of p and p prime means the vector in the direction of p or p prime, which has the smallest momentum of the two. And then there's a plus or minus sign here, because this is an operator times its Hermitian conjugate, and there are positivity properties, and if I'm, the, I'm on the backward null cone, the energy is negative, so I need a minus sign for the negative algebra. This is what I propose is the set of operators that parametrize the asymptotic states of quantum gravity. These operators, if you think about this algebra a little bit, for a fixed value of p and forget about this singularity, this is basically the massless supersymmetry algebra. So it will generate multiplets and if there are enough of these Qs, we'll have a multiplet of spin two, which is the graviton. There are constraints on what this algebra is and also the uh, generators that involve uh, Ps that travel along the null plane and describe massive particles. These, these algebras will be constrained by consistency conditions which are dynamical. I'm doing kinematics now, so the Zij that sits on the right-hand side here could be, from the point of view of kinematical symmetries, anything you'd like. Um, but I'm sure that that will be constrained once we come to dynamics because we know the spectrum of particles in supersymmetric theories of quantum gravity is highly constrained. So the scattering matrix is something that will map the operators on the positive uh, part of the null cone into the operators on the negative part or vice versa. It's the intertwining operator between the two. And the really important question, which gets to this question of are there particle states, what if the, there are no particles, what are the states, or what kind of representation of this algebra the asymptotic Hilbert space consists of. And the proposal, this is a proposal I made together with Willie Fischler, is that it's a space of what we call exclusive Sturman-Weinberg jets. So those of you who know the Sturman-Weinberg paper know that Sturman and Weinberg talked about processes in which a finite amount of momentum goes out through a certain spherical cap of fixed opening angle on the sphere. That's what they called a jet. They also, because they were doing massless QCD and it's full of infrared divergences, admitted the possibility that there were any number of massless particles with energy below some cutoff that got emitted in any possible direction and they summed over those inclusively. We're not going to do that. But we are going to say that if I have positive energy, let's say we're talking about what's coming out in the future, 
if I have positive energy, then the support of Q of P on the sphere at infinity consists of a finite number of spherical caps. What I mean by that is that the Hilbert space consists of states that we call jet states, which are such that this equals zero unless the uh, P is sitting within that finite number of spherical caps. So that's the analog of a state with a finite number of particles in Fox space. The question of whether you really could go to Fox space has to do with can we take these opening angles to zero and is that a complete basis for the Hilbert space? So this formalism leaves that up in the air but allows for the possibility that it's not, which I suggested to you in the first slide is actually the condition in any non-perturbative theory of gravity. <coughs> Now, in addition, we impose another constraint. The jets, the particles with zero momentum, according to Sturman and Weinberg, they could go out in any direction. So they're not restricted to these spherical caps, but there's something that you always want to do if you were an experimentalist, is you'd like to somehow, if you could, exclude them from the region right around the jet. You'd like to say, well, if there was one in the region right around the jet, I'd make the jet opening angle a little bigger and include it. And so I think about places where there are, quote, no hits in my detector. All of this language is very fuzzy. I will make it very precise in a moment. So that is our statement of what the Hilbert space is. And we call these exclusive Sturm and Weinberg jets because we are keeping the quantum information about all of the zero momentum particles. So we're not computing inclusive cross sections. There's a Hilbert space here. There's an operator that maps the Q pluses into the Q minuses. We can ask, is there a reasonable unitary operator that operates on this space? And I'll show you a context in just a minute in which um, all of that can be answered in a fairly uh, specific way. Now, of course, you'll complain to me at this point, well, how big are the annuli? Are they really exactly circular? Um, what, you know, what are you exactly talking about here? Let's be more precise. Are these operators fields? in the standard sense of quantum field theory. I believe not. I believe they're operator-valued measures rather than operator-valued distributions. But there's a, um, a way to make this all precise um, by going to finite causal diamonds. So if I go to a finite causal diamond, I have all sorts of issues with general covariance. Which finite causal diamond do I mean? All right. And the way that we've always dealt with that in the formalism that Fischler and I call holographic space-time is we introduce a time that is the time along some time-like uh, trajectory in space-time. And for the purposes here, I'll always take it to be a time-like geodesic in Minkowski space. That Time-like geodesic, if I look, pick some zero point to measure time from and go out in positive and negative directions by equal amounts, defines a sequence of nested causal diamonds, okay? So what I'd like you to think about is to think about the causal diamond whose size, whose proper time, or equivalently the size of the sphere at infinity, is n Planck units, where n is some extremely huge but finite number. The covariant entropy principle says that in such a causal diamond, the Hilbert space has finite dimension. And I proposed, um, actually, earlier in papers with Fischler, but very specifically in a paper uh, 
with uh, my student, John Cahayas, that the way to impose that finiteness was to do the following thing. The generators that I told you about before, the Qs, were null plane spinners. What does that mean? Q alpha, or maybe I didn't actually mention that, excuse me. Yeah, I didn't. So the, these commutation relations are compatible with the statement that P slash acting on Q is equal to zero and P tilde slash acting on Q of P tilde is equal to zero. That annihilates two components of the Qs and if I look at a particular direction, that's what's called the null plane spinner constraint. So I'm doing it that, that at each tangent space to the sphere and so the, uh, what is that saying really is that these spinners are elements of the spinner bundle over the sphere at infinity, okay? So now what I'm doing is taking that spinner bundle and cutting it off in order to get a finite number of degrees of freedom. And there's only one way to cut it off that's invariant under rotations, which is to say that I should cut it off by cutting off the spectrum of the Dirac operator on the sphere, which is the same thing as an angular momentum cutoff because of rotation invariance. So if I do that for the rest of this talk, let me just talk about this in, two, in four dimensions, so the sphere is two-dimensional, so you know what a cutoff on the spinner bundle of the sphere looks like. The cutoff spinner bundle can be thought of as variables psi ij which form an anti-symmetric n by n matrix where n, it's either n plus a half or n minus a half is the cutoff on the Dirac eigenvalue. Um, the, this is the set of variables and now I take the commutation relations that I had at infinity and except for one thing, I'm just going to copy those commutation relations in by expanding them out in spherical harmonics and just rewriting those same, instead of in terms of functions on the sphere, I rewrite things for spherical harmonics. These things just become spinners. Actually, psi is complex. It's a chiral spinner, two-dimensional chiral spinner on the sphere. Psi dagger is its complex conjugate, and those satisfy ordinary fermionic commutation relations. I purposely suppressed the P, the momentum that appeared in the uh, thing at infinite radius, um, and um, you'll see where that comes from in just a minute. So now I want to tell you what a precise finite version of the annulus constraints that I just talked about corresponds to in terms of these variables. What it corresponds to is saying that psi on an initial state at time minus n is block diagonal and it's got a lot of small blocks whose size is much smaller than capital N and one very large block whose size is n minus the sum of the sizes of all of the small blocks. That set of states satisfying that constraint, if I have a Hamiltonian that involves traces of powers of psi times psi dagger, uh, just single trace operators, will any such Hamiltonian will treat the individual blocks of this matrix as independent variables. It will propagate each block separately. That corresponds to the freely propagating jets at infinity. The very large block uh, in the Hamiltonian corresponds to the zero momentum particles that I told you about in the limit. Now what you can prove if you choose the appropriate large end scaling 
of that single trace Hamiltonian for literally any single trace <coughs> Hamiltonian with the correct coefficient in front of it, you can prove that the sum of the sizes of the small blocks is an asymptotically conserved quantum number as n goes to infinity. Basically what I'm saying is that I have of order capital N operator valued constraints on the initial state. And now I have a, a sequence of Hamiltonians, most of which don't act on most of the degrees of freedom because of causality. They, each Hamiltonian that propagates me through a small amount of proper time only acts on those degrees of freedom associated with that small causal diamond. And the Hamiltonian scale to zero as time goes to infinity, you can argue because of that that while you can remove finite numbers of those constraints or add finite numbers of constraints, you can't remove the large n, the order n constraints, and the coefficient of that is the sum of these EAs. So the sum of the EAs is the thing that is the emergent P plus that I talked about at infinity, and those of you who know about Steve Schenker's work on matrix theory know that that's exactly where longitudinal momentum comes from in matrix theory. So this is very similar to that. Um, now, I just told you how to describe things from the point of view of some particular geodesic. It could have been any time like geodesic in space-time, and the geodesics in Minkowski space are related by Lorentz transformations and spatial translations. And so we have to insist that this same physics can be studied in another system corresponding to time evolution along any one of those other trajectories, really an infinite number of other systems. And every time the causal diamonds associated with two of those different trajectories have an overlap, there's a consistency condition on the density matrices that uh, each system prescribes for the subset of degrees of freedom corresponding to the overlap. What you can show is that in the limit as n goes to infinity, those consistency conditions imply that the scattering amplitudes must be Poincaré invariant. I wrote super Poincaré on the transparency that reflects a belief rather than something that's been proven. The other thing I'd like to say is that while we have succeeded in constructing Hamiltonians that preserve rotation invariants and spatial translation invariants, we have not yet succeeded in finding explicit examples of Hamiltonians that have boost invariance. However, all of our Hamiltonians describe scattering. The scattering is local, unitary, has jets of particles in initial and final states, and also has metastable excitations with all of the qualitative properties of black holes for any choice of the single trace Hamiltonian that scales correctly. And in addition to that, oh, okay. I told the IT guy that there was no cutoff on my transparencies, but I guess there is. So let me just tell you what it says down there. We can do this in any number of dimensions, and in any number of dimensions you can show that the large distance scattering, the large impact parameter scattering implied by these Hamiltonian scales with energy and impact parameter like Newton's law. Most of them do not give Lorentz invariant scattering amplitudes, but they satisfy all of the rest of the criteria we'd like for theory of quantum gravity. And then finally, you can actually keep n finite if you keep n finite, eventually the Hamiltonian acts on all of the variables, and if you let it keep on acting, it will generically turn off all of these constraints and bring you back to a state where the things that I called zero momentum degrees of freedom 
are completely mixed up with the other degrees of freedom in a state of thermal equilibrium. That is, has many of the qualitative properties you would expect of a quantum theory of stable de Sitter space. And this definition of energy in terms of constraints leads immediately to an understanding of both the temperature and the entropy of both black holes and of de Sitter space. And so I'd like to stop at that point and just say one more time, Thank you, Nadi, for everything you've done for us, and happy birthday, Vad Mea Desling. Any questions? So I'm, I'm not sure whether it's a question for you or for Andy or for both or neither. Is there any relation between what you're doing and what he's doing? Yeah, look, we're, we both have in our formalism the BMS operators. We treat them in a rather different way. Andy has, has used them as symmetry generators to generate ward identities for graviton scattering, but thinking of the gravitons in terms of the usual field theoretic description. Um, I, I think that's completely valid. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I, I, I do believe that there's a deeper point of view in which we think of the spectrum of those generators really as the arena on which the scattering states live. And as you saw, when I think about it in terms of finite causal diamonds, part of that arena is emergent. It doesn't exist when I talk about the Hamiltonian evolution in finite portions of space-time. It just comes out. The fact that there's a scale to the momentum is something that comes out as a limiting asymptotic property, and it's, of course, related to Lorentz invariance, which we haven't succeeded in, in implementing. Um, the other thing that I think is important here is, number one, that uh, as compared to things that Andy has done, the entropy is always finite in finite regions, just by construction. And I don't have to take some field theory, which obviously has an infinite number of degrees of freedom, and start trying to figure out which ones to throw away. Um, and the, something else related to entropy that I think might be of some importance is the, the entropy per unit area is really related to flips of helicity and other quantum numbers, rather than to the values of the local BMS generators. Those just kind of tell you where you are on the sphere. But that, that last point, I think, is, is a kind of soft difference, and it might go away when we think about it more generally. Andy. So I, I confess to uh, not having read the, the paper as carefully as I should have, but 